Hello and welcome to episode 352 of the Filmmakers Podcast. This is a podcast where we talk filmmaking from indie film to studio films to documentaries to animation to high end TV and everything in between. How to get them made, how to make them, and how to try not to really F them up. In our very, very humble opinion. I'm Charles Alderson. I'm Donatello. <laughs> I bet you wish you were. I mean, I I did as a kid, for sure. Yeah, for sure. But everyone must have called you Domatello back then. I hope so. You'd have hoped so, but I feel like I feel like there wasn't the sort of the pun um, immersion back in in those days. Oh dear, it sounds like a really sad time. I know. No fun at all. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, Which brings us on perfectly to this week's episode. (laughs) Does it? Because (laughs) because there's no fun in this one. No. (laughs) Because we have on the director. Jeff Rowe, and the exec producer, Ramsey McBean, of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mutant Mayhem. Mayhem. Yeah. Woohoo! Very exciting. Very um, exciting. Let's, let's start uh, with Jeff Rowe. They weren't together for this interview. We did them separately. Mm. Um, so well, let's start with Jeff, the director, Jeff Rowe. So what do we talk about with Jeff, Don? Working in animation as a medium of storytelling. Uh, making something new and exciting on an existing IP whilst not annoying the people that loved the original Um, Mm -hmm. and how to pitch to studios yes we also talk about screenwriting how he got into screenwriting in the first place his story structure and how he moved to directing and why animation is often a three-year process that's Jeff Rowe. He's absolutely fantastic um, guy. He co-directed Mitchell's versus the Machines. He was also a writer uh, on Gravity Falls and on Disenchantment, um, both animation, adventure, comedies. He was just a delight to chat to. Really lovely guy. Really interesting. And um, yeah, I think you're going to love him and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he's done a fantastic job in the film. Yeah, it's got, it's got a lot of adult humour, lots of amazing action. Uh, And it's just a fun film. It's just a fun film. Uh, The film is written by Seth Rogen, um, Evan Goldberg and Jeff Rowe. And it's produced by Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogen, James Weaver. And exec produced by Ramsey McBean. Mm. And it stars Maya Rudolph, John Cena, Seth Rogen, Rose Byrne, uh, Giancarlo Esposito, Jackie Chan, Ice Cube and Paul Rudd, just to name a few. So let's get to it. This is myself uh, and Dom Noir chatting to... Jeff Rowe, uh, and then after we've had Jeff, we'll come back for a little catchy up, um, and then we'll introduce Ramsey McBean, the producer. See you in a minute. Cool. I'll see you on the other side. Enjoy. Hey, Jeff, how are you, buddy? Hey, good. How are you? Very good, mate. Very yeah. good. Very well. Yeah, it's nice. Where are you at the moment? In New York? I'm in New York, yeah. You're in London? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Rainy London. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love yeah. London. It's one of the best cities in the world. It's great. It is one of the best cities in the world. That and New York, I'd say. So mm. I think yeah. between us, we're doing all right. <laughs> we're just representing <laughs> greatness today. Yeah, we're uh, representing um, it. Yeah, yeah. How's it going? Everything all right? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Excited for the film to come out and just mm. see see how the world likes it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's such a such an exciting franchise as well. I mean, I, I grew up on the Turtles and I you know, watched mm. the cartoon. I watched all the, all the films. Uh, and I, I think you've gone in a really exciting direction for this. Are you sort of feeling good about the movie and enjoying all the, yeah, yeah, the screenings yeah. and having it out there? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it, it's like when you when you make one of these things, it's um, you probably watch the movie like a hundred times and it stops being funny and things stop making sense to you everything just feels like noise like you do that during the process of making it and then you do post where you like mix the film and color time the film and you watch it three times more in those final three weeks so i'm like uh numb to it right now i'm like i don't yeah. know when i'll be able to actually watch this in a theater with people and uh not be confused uh <laughs> it's uh, uh it's hard <laughs> it's it's that end process isn't it when you're delivering the film and you've watched it so many times and it can get so deflating and defeating and just you don't know what movie you've got anymore because you spent so long doing the fine details and tiny oh, little yeah. tweaks and changes to even credits and whatever and it's like you've got to watch it again just yeah, for those yeah, little yeah. moments well, and, and every fine detail it's like okay increase contrast 
three <laughs> percent. Oh no! Did I just ruin the movie? Did I? Just, yeah, exactly. We just lost ten Rotten Tomatoes percentage points with that change. It blew it. Uh, it's uh, yeah. it's uh, uh, it's psychologically damaging. I yeah. think you don't know what the audience is going to... You might have done many test screenings of it, but you don't know until you're... Mm. Yeah. You, you, the audience has sat there. It doesn't matter what the test screenings say, how many tweaks you do. It's yeah. just... It, it's, no, it's not your film anymore, right? Is that how it feels for you? It's like it's the audience is now. It's the fans of Turtles. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like... I, I, I imagine this is like what a parent who has a child going off to university feels like where it's like uh okay i uh -oh, did everything uh -oh. i could i hope yeah. i prepared you for the world but i can't control your actions anymore mm. so you just gotta go out there and, and like please don't uh mess it up <laughs> yeah uh, yeah please hoping don't mess for the it up. best so did you did you come into this with kind of fresh eyes or, or have you have you kind of grown up with the turtles as well? Like did you have that interest? Yeah, I, I mean I, I grew up with the turtles. Like I don't remember having thoughts as a human being before I knew what the Ninja Turtles were. So it, it, it imprinted <laughs> on me uh, at a young age and, and mm. I've always loved it and always adored it. Uh, but as we were like staffing up for the movie and I, I would go out to these artists that I really respected and a lot of them would be like, I've never seen anything from the Ninja Turtles. I don't know anything about them. Is that okay? And I was like, yes, do that. And don't watch anything. Like, come, like, I, I don't want your um, judgment to be clouded by uh, uh, nostalgia mm. or, or anything. Like, I think part of the challenge of making something feel fresh and new and exciting is just having, uh, 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 leaving those like preconceived notions behind you and just like, okay, that makes sense to me because I grew up with it, but what's going to make sense to like an audience today who knows nothing about the Ninja Turtles. And, uh, uh, so much of the work we did was trying to ground the film in, uh, logic. Uh, it's, it's a, strange premise but as much logic as you can squeeze out of teenage mutant ninja turtles and uh, uh emotional relatability and just like really investing time in the characters and and helping audiences uh care about them what was that kind of building on the kind of brotherhood and because they, they did have really good relationships with each other there was the comedy but really they were all they all, always had each other's back i mean was that sort of part of what you wanted to bring like what what else did you sort of yeah find interesting in the characters I mean, I think that's like a really interesting thing. Like they always had each other's back is like, is like uh, a thing that I've heard said about the turtle so many times. And it, and it's true in, in this film, but also like when you're 15 years old, you, you like the sense of like duty to family obligation, you're, you're just thinking about yourself and, and you're kind of selfish and it's like, uh, uh, like you do have, uh, uh, each other's backs, but it's, um, but you're also a lot more, um, self-interested and, and maybe unaware of, of, of other people. And it's like taking the like known thing and just shading it in a way that gives that added dimension and, and, and relatability, uh, felt, felt really important. And, and, the kids uh, who are playing the turtles are like actual mm -hmm. teenagers and, and that's, uh, that hasn't been done before are so uh, lovable and have such a good chemistry with each other. That's why we, why we chose them. Like uh, when we would record them, uh, Seth early on was like, they have to be in a room together and they have to be talking over each other and they have to be reacting to uh, uh, what, uh, what each other is saying. And, uh, we would get into these, the first time we got them all together, it was the first time they met in, in real life. And, uh, just seeing them talk in between takes about like, Oh, have you seen this YouTube video? Oh, I love this one. And like relate over, uh, a shared pop culture that they love. We're like, that's, that's a huge part of uh, being a teenager and that's a huge part of this film now we have to put this in there and and we threw a lot of script away to just do found things uh uh with the actors and uh um uh try to get it more organically i think than than animation usually allows for mm. well we love speaking of animation we love mitchell's versus the machines and oh, we've had uh, lord and miller on the podcast uh, in the past talking about that film and it, it's just a delight what was the process for you 
to get this film, had they already been thinking about making a Turtles movie? Because obviously with the existing IP, it's a great way to go because you try and shoot it. I think normally these days in that standard yeah. fashion would might not have worked. I think the animation is a fantastic and you've given it a brilliant look, which I think we'll come back to in a bit. But talking about how you sort of came on board with Seth Rogen and, and Evan Goldberg, had they already been thinking about this for a while before you came on board or was it your idea? Talk us through that. No, I, th- I think it was Brian Robbins and Ramsey Nido at uh, Nickelodeon Paramount mm-hmm. uh, at, at Nickelodeon at the time that were like, look, we have this IP. We want to make a new thing, uh, but we want it to be fresh and modern and, and relatable to like actual uh, uh, teenagers and and who I don't know who could we get to mm-hmm. do that? Who's a cool choice? Seth Rogen would he would he say yes? Are Seth and Evan going to do this? And uh, uh, fortunately, like they love Ninja Turtles, so when they got the call, they're like, "Yeah, that sounds great." Uh, here's what we would do with it: cast actual teenagers, actually make it about teenagers, uh, and uh, and the studio uh, at Nickelodeon and Paramount, to to their credit, kind of just let us do whatever we want. They're like, "Can you get it done by this date?" And we're like, "Yes." And they're like, "Okay, go go for it. Let it be visually inventive. Let it cast teenagers." Uh, mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a really uh, supportive experience, and 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 I think the the end result of, like the end result of the film benefits from Seth and Evan's passion about the franchise and the characters. Like they, they weren't just like we're producers collecting a paycheck, uh, put our names on it mm-hmm. and, uh, 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 pay up. Like they were really invested in trying to make a good film and, uh, uh really rolled their sleeves up and, and, and got involved, which was, uh, you know, for me as a fan of, film and a fan of their films and a fan of them uh it was a wonderful experience to, to work with them mm. when was it you came on board then like i say was it did you come in and speak to the team or were you already involved in like pitching other ideas and it all kind of came on organically talk us through that process for our directors listening you know pitching process yeah. when you're in the room how did it come about it's always interesting uh as we were finishing up mitchell's i was looking for my next uh project and my agent was like uh do you like the ninja turtles and i was like yes i, I love the ninja turtles Ooh, what are you what are you talking yeah. about uh he's like do you like seth and evan movies i'm like fantastic. Who doesn't? Uh, and he's like well seth and evan are doing a ninja turtles movie it's like kind of like in high school it's like a teen thing it's uh uh i don't know you probably won't get the job uh <laughs> but uh uh i can set a meeting and then i had this like series of like like boss battles in a video game, each one getting progressively more <laughs> difficult where, uh, uh, yeah. And there, there are a handful of them. I'm like, well, I looked to that. That was, uh, but they kept progressing me on to the next group of people until I finally met with Seth and Evan. And it's not often that you, you're, you're, uh, I, I just like, stammered and talked and just like uh, naturalism uh, mitchell's versus the machines which wasn't out at the time. So like no one had, uh, yeah, fallen um, in love with it yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're just like I in multiples of those interviews, I would like start talking to like James Weaver, who's also a producer on the film, and uh, uh, and then like I'd hear the audio through Zoom, like he had started to watch the trailer uh, partway through the interview because he's like, "Who is this? Who am I talking to?" Uh, but thankfully, the trailer was was good and looked cool and was enough to uh, uh, make people uh, interested in continuing to talk to me. They'd be like, I'm Jeff Rowe. I don't know. Mitchell's versus the machines. What is that? Let me watch. The tra- oh, shit. Sounds on. Let me uh, 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 turn that off quickly. Um, I, I think I in those meetings, uh, uh, I just and this is the advice I would give to directors and uh, 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 people is just like. Like, don't try to be clever. Don't try to be smart. Just like, like be authentic. And if it's, if it's something that you're passionate about, lean into your passion and talk about your passion and talk about, Mm. uh, um, why you love it and, and what your thoughts are on it. Because, uh, like, you're not going to get hired for guessing the right answer. You're going to be, hired for providing an answer that's authentic and true to you that the people on the other side of the, the call didn't even know they were, they were looking for. Um, uh, I'm still shocked. I got it, but uh, <laughs> happy to be there. 
So, so were the, were the script and the art style kind of fairly locked in place when you were going through this pitching process, or, or was that something that you had a reasonable no. amount of of process with? No, there, 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 there was like nothing. Like the script was in process, and and the original mm. versions of the script, uh, 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 like the turtles were uh, in high school on like page. 30 and it was like just them in high school for the movie and uh, uh it was like wildly different and um uh, and there was no art style uh uh or anything uh, uh i think they were just like don't don't make it look stupid <laughs> uh, uh, you know we, we uh so so while i was waiting for the script to be done i i put all my energy into developing the art style and I, I would put together uh, mood boards and, and started building a, a, a team of uh, uh, artists and, and things I knew early on is like, we want these characters to feel real and relatable. So they have to be emotionally grounded. And that means they exist within a real world. New York needs to look like New York, not a cartoon fantasy of New York. Like, like let's see, the the Seven Eleven cup on the ground. Let's see mm. the stickers on the signs. Let's see the graffiti. Like let's uh, uh, have things feel uh, feel real because that creates like a, a foundation springboard for the for when the fantastic elements of the film happen. They're ten times more exciting because you, you you've mm -hmm. invested in uh, uh, in the reality and. Um, and also, like, uh, so much of what I love about the original franchise and the toys and the movies is just how unhinged they are. The designs mm. are so inventive and playful and and really, really go for it. Uh, uh, and, and I'm like, I also want that. Like, I want mutant. I want that to be part of this, uh, 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 this film and things to be really complex characters with a lot of detail that's, like, really difficult to do in in animation but that, that was the thing we committed to uh uh early on and uh and then script came in and uh, we had that and we put up a version of it and i think the studio was like great you did it cool let's go let's get it done <laughs> and then like uh, uh seth and i were like mm, it's got to be it's got to be like 20 times better than this and then we we wrote we rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it and then again at one point when we miraculously got a meeting with trent reznor and agnes ross to, yeah. to, to do the score uh like we talked to them and we talked to them about the movie and they're like cool like send us a script or like show us a screening or something and we'll and we'll let you know and we're like Okay, we have to make the movie like ten times better. Uh, uh, again, <laughs> let's completely like rewrite it and fix any any lingering doubts we had uh, to impress our our music heroes. Um, yeah, sometimes you need those little kick kick up the asses, don't you? Those yeah. little moments that make you just go, "Oh my god, we thought we were ready," and someone else comes. Yeah, yeah. Go, we can't send it and to then, them yeah, like and this. Then you imagine like Trent yeah. Reznor sitting in a room <laughs> watching it, and you're like, "Yeah." No, this has to be better. <laughs> <laughs> you've yeah. always you've always written. You mentioned writing then coming on you and Seth rewriting and rewriting. You know, when you start to write Gravity Falls, uh well, when you're part of that writing team, how did you get into it? Because it it you kind of had a you've had a great journey, I suppose. You know, you've written three T V series yeah. or two at the time before Mitchell's versus the Machines. How did you get into Disney in the first place? What was your journey in to this to start yeah. working on big shows straight away? It's a funny story. Mike Rianda who directed Mitchell's? I mm -hmm. co-wrote it uh, uh, with him. Uh, uh, a very funny, uh, 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 amazing guy. He was like my best friend in uh, college. And then yeah. uh, after we both left animation school, he went to go work on Gravity Falls on the first season. Wrote so many good episodes, like the inconvenience. Like he, he's, he's so talented and funny. And after season one, he's like, I want to go do something different. I want to go write my own film uh but i i don't want to leave alex hanging so i'm gonna try to find a, a a replacement for myself and i was working at like a theme park design company at the time doing concept artwork and uh mike uh called me up and he was like hey jeff I i'm looking for a writer replacement for myself uh do you know anybody funny and i was like <laughs> What about me? And me, I'm funny. Like, I'm really funny. Yeah, I, I'm really funny. Self, self admitted. Like, <laughs> yes. It was like, um, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. 
uh, and he he gave me a um, a writing test. Mm -hmm. uh, Alex had writers on the show do like a writing test to see if they could match the uh, voice mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, tone of the show, sure. which was very specific. And he he kind of like slid me the test under uh, under the table, and then uh, I did it, and apparently did a good enough job that he he shared it with Alex, and then uh, they they brought me on board. But I, I never really written a script before that. I wow. just made short films while in school, and uh, uh, and when I started writing, I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. um, because I'm bad at drawing. I compare it to like my peers, like I do not draw very well. Um, and uh, I would have these ideas and then executing them was always like, oh, I can't do this. My I guess. can't actually pull this off. But. What was your process of learning to write? I mean, it, it, it's a difficult thing to understand, story structure, um, you know, getting the characters right. How, how did you sort of navigate through that process? Because obviously you've done quite well to pass this test and, you know, mm -hmm. emulate uh, something in existence. Yeah, I mean, I mean, honestly, like, like part of part of it was just like, encyclopedic knowledge of the Simpsons and their comedic uh, timing. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. I was like, I know the cadence of this style of show. It's like in my bones. It's in my DNA. Mm. I, I can't step outside of it. And and in school, we had had uh, a class about story structure. We read like Robert McKee's story. And, and you oh, know, yeah. I was a freshman in college. So I was like, this is stupid and by the books. And I, I, <laughs> I, I hate it for being so rigid. Yes. And then uh, with, with time, I, I like in Gravity Falls, I would find myself like, uh, uh, like a mechanic looking at a diagnostic manual or something. Like, why does this story not work oh uh robert mckee uh, uh things mm. are driven by choices no one's making a choice on on this page and uh, mm. uh, uh i would i would remember those things and also alex hirsch the the gravity falls showrunner is a like story structure genius mm. so it was like conditioning for sports or something like we would break so many episodes of tv with so many different unique but like tight three act structures uh, that he he would just drive, and it, it was like a master class in um, learning how to how to break a story and 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 what works and what doesn't work. Because for every script that made it on TV, there's two to ten scripts that got thrown away. I love the fact that you had one class pretty much in college <laughs> on screenwriting and then you've developed and into the class this... of the simpsons <laughs> yes exactly and watching the simpsons over and over and i think that's amazing it shows that you have natural talent but then you came back to structure and i think that's really key here that in the end you went yeah okay you can have natural talent and you can throw in dialogue and bits and pieces but sometimes you have to come back to structure and story beats which i think is fascinating then so I suppose moving on to mitchell's versus the machines then within that because obviously you're part of that team, you wrote it, you're the co-director of those scenes. Did that, that obviously came from the back, as you said, of, you know, Gravity Falls and Disenchantment and your work there. What, again, what talks yeah. through that process as well? Mike Rianda, again, uh, mm. he, he, from, from not wanting to uh, uh, give me a test, uh, but by the time I had been on Gravity Falls and, and, and him and Alex are close. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, he was aware of the work that I was doing on, uh, season two, and, and sometimes I would send some of those scripts to him just just for his his notes and and feedback. And by but you know, he got the opportunity to make Mitchell's versus the Machines. The studio uh, was like, you need a co writer. Let's pair you with uh, some famous live action writer or someone. Mm -hmm. And Mike's like, that sounds terrible. Like they're not going <laughs> to understand animation. They're not going to care about it. Like, can I just like. Jeff's doing a good job on Gravity Falls. Can I just hire him? Uh, and then he came to me, and I was like, yeah, "Yes, I would. I would love to do that." And and Sony said yes. And then uh, we just spent like two and a half. I mean, we were rewriting that until it was taken out of our hands. That's that's our process. That's uh, uh, that's what we do. That's what Chris and Phil mm -hmm. uh, does. That's what Seth and Evan do. Uh, just constantly iterating towards greatness or. or Attempting, Tempting, yeah. Uh, uh, greatness. <laughs> and um, how did you make the the jump across from sort of writing to directing? What were the what were the challenges in that progression? Because it's it's the same thing, but it's also very different. 
the, the, the nice thing is like Mitchell's was like about Mike's family. It's 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 his film. He he knows those characters. Like it was his world, and he had done some uh, 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 directing work on Gravity Falls, and then also we had Chris and Phil uh, uh, above us, who were these like really kind, supportive mentors who kind of taught us like fight this, don't fight this, work mm. on this, don't worry about that, focus on this. This thing, you can push back on because they're technologically able to change it. This thing, you won't be able to win. Don't put your effort there. Uh, uh, it, it was so good to, to, to learn from them. And uh, I was there to support Mike and his vision and help him get what he wanted on, on screen. And, and that, that was a job of like, well, have you thought about this? Maybe you could do it that way. And uh, a common thing we would do is uh, we would separate. We'd have an idea for a scene. And we're like, well, what's better? I don't know. We're lost in the woods. Okay, Mike, you take one. I take one. We go in different uh, uh, edit bays. We build out versions of it. And then we just taste test them and uh, uh, just keep trying things out until we find what uh, what worked. Uh, and then... And then I'm like, great, I know how to direct now. And then you do it on your own. And you're like, I miss Mike so much. Yeah, and you're like, it's a lonely, yes. lonely process. And you yeah. just, uh, uh, I think it was like Mike mm. Nichols uh, uh, who said, like, every director needs a, needs a buddy. Uh, and, and I think what that means is you just need that person that you can sanity check ideas against where you're like, I think this is cool, but I might be insane. I've watched this movie a hundred times. Like, does this make sense anymore? And and having someone whose taste you trust uh, to say like, yes, that's awesome. Go with that is a, uh, uh, helps you get to decisions and consensus so much. So yeah, much quicker. it does. Having that team with you and around you is so important. And like you say, it can be lonely sometimes. What about when you're working with the actors themselves, the voice actors? Look, the, you know, what an amazing cast. Rose Byrne, Jackie Chan, John Cena, Seth Rogen, Paul Rudd, Giancarlo Esposito. You know, the list goes on in terms of who you've got, Maya Rudolph, Ice Cube. <laughs> uh, not not to mention the kids. What about yeah. directing those? You know, suddenly now you're working with these amazingly talented actors and you're talking through how you want them to say mm -hmm. the lines or directing them through those choices. Yeah. On Mitchell's, like, M Mitchell's was a little bit of a different comedy style where we had jokes with, like, setups and punchlines. And they were, like, like in that Simpsons style, like, they were intended to be uh, jokes. So, like, me and Mike would write these. Mike would scratch all the voices himself. And we'd have, like, a very clear idea of the exact mm. way to say it yes. that makes it funny. So often in these records, we would, like, try to, without line reading, like, how do we get the person to say the thing in the way that we intended or do something, do something better? And that was the challenge. And, and with this film, it was just improvisation and, mm. and which, which I, I think was, was like easier to me and led to a better product because it was like, if you give the same note twice and it, and the actor doesn't like pick up on it. The problem is not with the actor. It's with the, uh, it's with the line. It's like, okay, they're not getting what I'm going for. And that means that what I'm going for might be flawed. So, so I think like having experienced writing and also having Seth there, or, uh, a lot of the time we could just be like, that's not going anywhere. Let's rewrite. Mm. What's, what's something else that we can do here? And uh, uh, it was very uh, uh, improvisational. And, and I think the, the cast appreciated being able to, to do that. And then also like Ice Cube is, is like, he's a master lyricist. He's so mm. funny. Like he's really good at writing. Like he, he's, yeah. uh, uh, he's a writer too. Like Io at a beer, like, is a, a wonderfully talented writer and would be able to like improv uh, with direction. Like, like, oh, I can improv in a way that's funny and moves the scene forward instead of it's just funny, but uh, uh, tangential. Mm. Do you have any issues when doing this kind of animation style in terms of doing like pickups? Um, mm. If you've kind of set the the scene in terms of the animation or you maybe recorded the, the voices, like how, how does that work in terms of going back? Did you need to do much of that or was the improvisation kind of figured? out in advance 
It was uh, the impro improvisation kind of figured it out in advance. You always have to do pickups and you always have to like, does that fit in the mouth shape? Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. People, <laughs> people don't pay that close of attention. Uh, and then when you have a giant flapping turtle mouth, it's like different yeah. than like an actual human face. <laughs> One of the advantages to this is like, there's no coverage. Like you can improv for, for 60 minutes and then uh, not worry about how the camera angles cut because it's just uh, uh audio so it's like we would just let the tapes roll we would get conversations not about the movie but just between the kids in between takes where they're just talking about youtube videos and uh, we would take all of that and go into edit and then it was like a really long really painstaking process to just like piece that mm. into something uh uh cohesive but by the time we got to that piece together thing it it felt as natural as what was in the record and uh uh there was, there was like, there's also a couple times where we just had to re-record things because of audio issues, uh, and then we just tried to match exactly what they had improv the uh, the first time. Mm. It must be a fascinating process from start to finish. Uh, what's the time scale then? How long have you been working on this film? You know, because obviously with live action, it's sometimes sometimes shorter. With animation, it can take long, long time. So for you, it'd be interesting to know when you first started and. You know, obviously now it's release time. Yeah, it, it's it was three years. Like Mitchell's right. was five years, and no one ever mm. wanted to make the Mitchell's. Uh, uh, like this, the uh, Sony Animation believed in it, but like Sony, the parent company, was like, oh, we know, we don't know about this thing. Uh, so, so it was just like two and a half years of like me and Mike, like remaking it and remaking it and trying to like prove it out and prove that that uh, it could be real and then chris and phil saw it and they're like this is great you should make this and that kind of made it possible and then this one was like we just need this movie around this date so uh, having having like an end date having a timeline uh that was compressed like that it was really challenging because you have to do a lot in a very short amount of time but i i, I also find it easier to stay motivated when there when there's an end in mind and you're not just like mm -hmm. like pouring tons of work into something that you might not know if it will ever be seen outside of uh, mm. uh your office yeah yes amazing could we just get one last bit of advice that you might either give yourself when you were starting out in the business uh, or maybe some aspiring filmmaker uh before we wrap this up i think a thing i I struggled with early on was uh, was just like self doubt, imposter syndrome. I mean, I told you the story of how I became a writer. I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here. This is not. Uh, um, but so so uh, I would often be afraid of doing something that wasn't um, perfect because I I don't I wouldn't want to look imperfect or or uh, have to acknowledge my my perceived shortcomings. And that sometimes came at the cost of me uh, working. It would lead to procrastination. And, and the thing, it, it took me a long time to learn how to learn and how to just like try something and then react to it. Walk, get a cup of coffee, go back to it, read it, and then see how you feel about it and, and have that conversation with yourself. And, and you get to your answers quicker by working through it as, as uncomfortable and uh, uh, as vulnerable as, as that is. And, uh, and also like giving yourself breaks. And, and uh, if you're like, I'm going to start at this time and I'm going to end at this time, it, it gives you permission to do more within that time is what I find. But uh, uh, Josh Weinstein, who was a showrunner on The Simpsons, and, and I wrote with him on Gravity Falls, and he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, but he gave me advice early on that was like, good writing requires writing and i'm like oh yeah that's 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 true <laughs> all, all mm. writing. that is perfect that is absolutely brilliant thank you so much jeff Rowe, for your time and yeah. listen best of luck with teenage mutant ninja thank turtles you so it's much. super yeah, exciting. very excited for it very excited mutant mayhem let's all do it yeah um, <laughs> thank you <laughs> totally amazing <laughs> how dare you uh, <laughs> How dare he? <laughs> he shells out puns all the time. <laughs> I do, I do. Yeah. We, Sorry, we went Jeff. through quite a few uh, please, mutant please turtle stop. puns before this, but uh, we, we saved you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, anyway, we'll yeah. never stop. best of luck and lovely to chat. Lovely to chat. Yeah, all the best with everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs>
Well, there we have it. That was Jeff Rowe uh, talking about Teenage Mutant mm. Ninja Turtles, which is out now in cinemas. Um, what a fun little movie and what a wonderful man. Yeah, it was, it was really an enjoyable chat. Yeah, yeah. I loved him talking about the writing process there and how he moved from being a, a screenwriter to a director, how he, you know, found his feet. I think that's incredible, really. When you think about a journey of someone, it means he had talent. It means that he was very affable and nice person people wanted to work with him as well yeah no definitely and, and I think uh, I think I'm seeing there's, there's two sort of parallels which I which I really like in um, one of the other interviews that we did for, for Paramount for, for Transformers as well is you know finding people who have a passion for the sort of the franchises and and bringing that warmth uh, into the into the mix, but also mixing it up with new ideas, and, and I think that's way that way you get these offerings that are both fresh but also authentic, uh, and, and I hope uh, hope it does well. I really do too. Well, anyway, let's get on to Ramsey McBean. He's the exec producer of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's also exec produced Paw Patrol, the movie Sherlock Gnomes, uh, co-produced Cherry Cake. And when he was at Micross Animation, he did the SpongeBob movie. SpongeBob on the run. Um, what a lovely guy. What do we talk about with Ramsey? We talked about how to exec produce an overseas production, how to win projects at Paramount, and the importance of communication and collaboration for creating good work amongst the team. We also talk about story and improvisation when you're working with actors and how you might have to change everything because Ice Cube's come up with something really funny or Seth Rogen has and you've got to do all the animation again um, which I imagine happened time after time um, and how he rewrites and changes scenes and how he oversees everything and manages the film from an exec producer point of view mm. yeah he was great what a delight to chat to him we met him at the turtle lair yeah so after we watched the movie Myself and Dom went down to the catacombs mm. in Waterloo, yeah. under the dungeons, the under the arches, the sewers. We went down inside to the turtle lair mm. where Dom did some skateboarding and I watched and yeah. filmed it. <laughs> and um, yeah, that, that was pretty cool. That was pretty amazing. Yeah, was, and then was, we, met, fun, yeah. we met Ramsey in there. Yeah. We met him in there. They gave us some free pizza and yeah. um, a slushy. Um, yeah. And that's where we met Ramsey and McBean in there, and he was very generous with his time. And we had a yeah. lovely chat before we recorded the episode, so we got some photos with him, which yeah. is really nice, which will be on our socials very soon. Yeah, let's let's get to it. This is Ramsey McBean um, rounding out our chat about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Mutant Mayhem, which is out in cinemas now. Um, Go see it; it's fun. So here it is. Enjoy. Hello. Hello, buddy. Hello again. How are you? I'm good. I'm. Uh, it's all a little bit overwhelming, to be honest, but it's. Uh, I'm good. Uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, I can imagine it's overwhelming and weird as well to not have your cast being allowed to come and do any mm. press. So it's kind of you and the director, the production team, sort of going right. Let's check our voices out there, which is yeah, great for us. Yeah. Yeah, obviously, obviously, you know, it's great for us to be able to support the movie, but obviously it's a shame to not have mm. the cast, especially the boys, uh, mm. meeting the world because they're just so lovely and charming and amazingly talented young men that it's a shame that the world hasn't been able to meet them. But I'm sure once the slag strikes over, everybody will want to want to know who these kids are. Yeah, for sure. They're yeah. fantastic in the movie, aren't they, Dom? Mm, yeah, I mean, it was one of those real cornerstones of my childhood watching the sort of the teenage mutant ninja turtles um in the cartoon the films um so you know going into this i i kept an open mind but i was like this is this may or may not ruin my childhood it may it may be an incredible experience it completely blew me away because it it was so faithful to what everyone loved about the originals and yet also really fresh and accessible for a, a new audience and what, what was your kind of connection to the turtles were you fresh going into this or did you, have you sort of grown up on them loving them no i was i was exactly like you in the sense of just like they were my they were my pinnacle of uh of childhood like they were my number one like never mind mm. batman spider-man the turtles were my thing mm. i can remember going to universal uh i think it was at universal studios when i was like maybe four or five years old and the turtles were there and yeah. I saw them and, you know, I was, I was born in 88. So the first movie came out when I was about uh, maybe f four or five, three or four years yeah, old. Or it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and like, it was such a dark 
movie, but it was so like intriguing to me, you know. Uh, and and I think like the mm-hmm. second movie was much more comedic, and and I loved the comedy of the second mm-hmm. one as well. But the first one was always so interesting and edgy and engaging in that way. And you know, I watched the cartoons. I would get like VHS sets because I grew up in the Caribbean, so like we didn't have like oh, cable wow. TV or anything. So like we were getting like VHSs sent over to us, and it was the Hero Turtles. Oh, wow. My parents are from uh, from the UK, so we were getting those sent over and watching them i think that darkness sort of there's a kind of weight to that that i i found really sort of forming as a child actually um you know because there there is sort of sadness and loss and there's there's sort of humanity and, and i think you've really captured that in the in the new ones um was that always sort of part of the the goal was to try and make it a film with weight you know that children could really sort of learn from in that sense as well I, I, honestly i think like uh, you know, you know, my job on these movies is to observe and react to the creative process. Of course, I like try and contribute in whichever way I can, and the best idea wins. But most of those best ideas come from Jeff and Seth and Evan <laughs> because they're just so incredibly talented. But you know, uh, it, it was never like I don't think anybody went into it saying this is what we're going to do. I think it just kind of naturally became what it was. And sort of, we all knew tonally what type of movies we liked, and especially Jeff and Seth had a sort of cornerstone of the tone that they wanted to hit. And and I think that kind of guided a lot of the way, like, no matter what we did in our screening, there was always a tone thing that felt right. It was always like, yeah, the tone of this is right, and we should keep on this path. And, you know, it, and that edgy tone was always so engaging and interesting to us. And we we made a movie so that when we went to the bar with our friends after showing them the film, they didn't tell us that we ruined our, their childhood dreams. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that was yeah. more important to all of us in some ways than, like, mm. the, what the five-year-olds thought. It was more important for what, like, what our, our you know, this was such an important IP to all all of us growing up mm. that uh that you know the 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 idea of not successfully giving uh, our generation a movie that we would love and appreciate uh as well as be able to take our children to was also a big part of it mm, you have definitely done that absolutely um mm. and it's great that it's being released you know now as well i feel it's a good time people going back to the cinema it feels fresh it feels exciting when was it that you first came on board were you on early days was it you part i came on i came on about the production had maybe been running for about nine months when i when i joined the movie um i joined in like april of 2021 so and then i finished like you know friday (laughs) it was kind of my last day but you know uh i came on to it but it was the it was the middle of covid so it was just such a different world like you know we kind of forget what that was like two and a bit years ago now but you know, I was, I live in London and, and I woke up to a text message that changed my life that said, would you like to come and help produce the Ninja Turtles movie? And I was like, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> like, I was like, uh, there was not even a, an ounce of my, uh, of reluctance in, in saying yes to that. And everybody was working remotely at the time anyway there was no studio presence at that time. Everybody was still very worried about, you know, uh, COVID and, mm. And so I just shifted my hours and I worked, you know, started work at 3 p.m. and finished work at midnight or 1 a.m. And that was mm-hmm. just the, what I did for the whole that whole production when, when I was in London. Tell us about that, just getting the text, because I think a lot of people will be going, well, hang on, why aren't I getting a text saying, can you come yeah. work on a brilliant <laughs> franchise? Yeah. How did that come about? Had you, obviously, you know, there's some amazing credits behind you with a SpongeBob movie, Paw Patrol movie, Sherlock Gnomes as well, which is fantastic and really fun. Um, yeah. To, to what, how did this come about? Because obviously it's not just a text out the blue, etc. Had you pitched on it? Had you been talking to the teams? Was it, well, it, did yeah, you know? I had, I, I had, I had a, very random journey to to this movie uh Mm. in the sense that i really you know outside of la it's very hard to be a part of these big studio movies and kind of like your only access point is through vendors essentially where like they shipped the animation and you can you can work on the movies from that standpoint so you know my i was working originally in very very low budget independent movies um and and most of which were animated in India and I was kind of I would kind of supervise them from here and I kind of came up through that and just kind of learnt sort of production on really, really low budget films. 
And then uh, I got the opportunity to join Micro's Animation when they were making uh, Sherlock Gnomes, and that happened to be getting made in London. So I just got very lucky that there was a film here. And that was the first film to feature film to be made in London for a long time since like Tales of Despero. So like mm. there was like a good like almost 10 year, I think, gap between those two films for CG animation. So it was such a big opportunity and it became a sort of hub of talent uh, that wanted to do a bigger uh, movie. But I came at the very end of it and helped sort of deliver it and kind of had a relationship with Paramount from that standpoint. Um once I delivered that movie and then when uh, Spongebob was getting set up, you know, I didn't, I didn't help. I didn't like produce the movie, but I helped set it up at the very beginning. Um, and sort of like a key part of what I was doing uh, when I was at Micros was trying to help the creative collaboration between the people in LA and the people on the vendor side. So like you have all of these amazingly talented French artists that were either in Montreal or Paris in that studio. And you're kind of trying to like bridge the cultures between LA uh, studio mentality and people who had come from working at DreamWorks and all of these other studios to people who had never worked on on those movies but were very talented and were kind of trying to do their own thing and, and contribute in their own way. So I was kind of like bridging that for a little bit and that was where sort of Paw Patrol and these movies were kind of happening and I, I set up an, a couple other films like that and sort of my relationship with Paramount was because I'd kind of worked with them a little bit on that capacity and actually I was running the test phase so basically when you set up these movies if you don't own your own animation studio the way paramount doesn't you do a test and you call out to vendors and you say hey we've got can you do a 30 second test for us and you know that's a test of product but more importantly it's a set test of process and it's a, a test of like how do the teams get along do they collaborate well together how does that work and sort of my whole thing in that world was to try and essentially convince the la side that like you could collaborate with us and we would help you make that movie as partners. And um, it was sort of during that 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 uh, I met Jeff and I met Yashar, the production designer, and sort of we kind of all got along pretty well and the studio kind of knew me and and – and, you know, that that type of we kind of clicked in a way. And for me, like, you know, my job was like to try and win projects for the studio. And like, I was not about to lose Ninja Turtles. <laughs> was, yeah. We have to make this movie yeah. like this is like fight with is, any weapon possible. Yeah, yeah like whatever <laughs> Even it takes. If it's a like, stick. I, exactly. I will lie down on the road. <laughs> what, what was what was some of the, the process of the actual animation style that you ended with? Was it the first kind of test that you did was with that? Uh, that kind of process or were there lots of other ones it was very different than the first test we did i think we were in they were in early stages of sort of visual development of the movie at that point and they kind of just wanted they knew they wanted to do something stylized but they weren't quite sure what and and sort of we you know like i said that that part of the movie is never about the product because you know the look is going to change you know that people are going to change the designs that's always it but the the important thing is like can we work together to create something that looks good and then we'll change what it is and it will still look good as long as we can we know we can produce something so it was much more beautiful i guess uh in quotation marks than the um than the final product it was kind of like the note at the end of it was like this kind of looks too pretty to be uh, the movie and like you know it was like it was mm. very very well executed but it, there was something about it that didn't quite feel right and kind of looked a little bit like some of the other animation that we knew was kind of coming and so i think like you know yashar the production designer went back and reevaluated and that's kind of where the look came from various iterations after I, that. I love it the look was so interesting and, and and fascinating it was there ever a point with any movie like this and i'm pretty sure the answer is yes but it'd be interesting to know from the animation side where you're developing this project but it could fall down they could say no we with the look of this it's not working or the idea is not working was that development process after you came on board was it still ongoing was there still a chance that you know we still need to get the yeses from, you know, Paramount at this point. Uh, no, I think like, you know, the, the fortunate thing about this movie is that everybody was so passionate and believed in the team from the very beginning. Like, you know, we had all movies go through their ups and downs and have their good moments and their bad moments. But ultimately we all knew deep in our heart that like, 
Seth and Point Grey's experience combined with what Jeff had brought to Nickelodeon and Paramount combined with sort of the CG animation people that we had put in place like we're gonna make something great it was just like we all had to kind of hold hands and just be like we're all in this together guys (laughs) studio included and and you know I think that that's what allowed us to work very collaborative with each other and honestly about the things that were working at the moments that they were working and the things that weren't working at the moments that they weren't. And, you know, I think there was obviously some questions at the very beginning of the visual development, like, what is this? (laughs) You know, (laughs) what is this going to be? Like, what is it going to look like? And honestly, part of us, part of us didn't even know what it looked like. You know, we were playing with so many rules that like, we're very established, like perspective and things like this in CG that you're like, you know, you, we have to keep perspective. You can't break perspective in art. You know, it has to always be to camera. And and the truth is in our movie, perspective is never is to camera for maybe one shot. But then the rest of the shots, it's not. The, the design mm-hmm. doesn't work like that. And it, it kind of made it free. And once we realized that worked, we kind of – the shackles were off and we could do uh, – the, the visual development team could push things a lot further. Mm-hmm. Do you have to f- sort of factor in the flexibility um, with a film like this? Because we've mentioned that the actors do a lot of improvisation. Um, how do you kind of factor that in with scheduling and budget and kind of working things out, at, you know, at certain points? Is, is that a challenge or is it something you have to discuss really up front? Well, I think like, you know, I think for for this, this was always about being able to be as reactive and pro- as possible because being proactive was kind of challenging because of how unpredictable a lot of the things were. And, uh, and a lot of that was based around story, like what would work, what wouldn't work, what the actors would improvise. And really, like I said, it was always best idea wins. So no matter where you are in the process of the movie, if somebody does says a line or does a joke and it's good, you're kind of like, well, we got to put that Mm -hmm. in the movie, you know? (laughs) And, and it was kind of my job to work with Jeff and Seth and like as much as possible, try and get that into the movie essentially uh by you know begging (laughs) the uh, various other people that would have to do the work to to do it you know but you know i think that the good thing is is that like i said it wasn't just us who believed in it every you know whether you were an animator or a junior artist or whatever everybody felt like they were gonna be a part of something special um and you know that's that was our goal and you know if you're an animator or somebody who works outside of like the big studio system a movie like this does not come along very often like this is a mm. very very big ip with a very very big producer mm-hmm. and a great director and great production team for you to get to work on you know outside of the la studio system so what an incredible opportunity and because of that we just had talent pouring in from all over the world to come and work on the movie and that allowed us to be more flexible and absorb more changes because all of these people were so good at what they did that that when we changed something they would catch up quickly on the schedule side you know you know it was it was super dynamic uh throughout can you talk us through the time process of something like this from when you came on to going through the starting the animation process and then the the actors coming on doing the dialogue and then redoing the animation type thing to actually getting a a version where you can show how long does that process take especially on a movie like this well i think like there's the you know the we have lots of different there's lots of different things going on at once in terms of like the machine of everything and you know at peak we have like every single department running while also doing story while also finishing shots Mm -hmm. but the story is in flux throughout that whole thing right so you know when you're at early stages you're getting a script and you're storyboarding the script and you're and you're you sometimes don't even have the voices the real voices in and you're just trying stuff out and experimenting and you know a big you know now that you've seen the film like you can tell the boys being together was a big (laughs) influence on the movie like recording them together Mm. Is, was such a magical thing, but we didn't get to do that until halfway through the movie because of COVID. Right. So you couldn't put four people in a room. So we're there making a movie normally, you know, as you normally do. And we're, you know, things are, it's like, okay, this is working, that's working. And then halfway through the production, we get the four boys in a room together with Seth and Jeff, and they just go be teenagers and they just, 
the room exploded with energy and we just went, <laughs> wait a minute, everything we have done is going to change. Like this has changed everything about what we know, how we're going to record them, how we're going to deal with all of this. It just changed everything. And to Jeff and Seth's credit, as much as I was like, please, can we do it remotely again? They would be like, no, because <laughs> obviously on the coordination of getting those everybody together all at the same time is always a, always a challenge. But they were absolutely right. It was like once we all sat in the room and saw it, uh, it was it was so it was so magical and so spontaneous. And, uh, you know, somebody in my job, uh, it's a nightmare, but they're, because we all cared so much about the movie, we're like so passionate about trying to make that work. And, and how did cast come into the considerations? Because there's, there's a pretty big cast for, for the animation. Was that always, okay, well, we need to work on this animation style. There's going to be this much action. It's going to take this long. But let's, we, we need this amount of cast. Or, or was it kind of a bonus? Because it, it does feel really loaded uh, with some you know, great names as well as the incredible sort of turtles as well. Yeah, I mean, it was all like, uh, as the story was evolving, sort of the cast was getting plugged in. But, you know, it was the sometimes the characters were changed drastically within a two week period of writing. Right. So you're really like, oh, this person is the per- perfect person for that role. And then you're going, oh, no, wait, that's, <laughs> it's not that role anymore. It should be this role, you know, and, and finding the right people and leading with comedy was always a big thing. Like, the great thing about our cast is they're all incredible actors, but they're all actually naturally very funny as well. And, and mm-hmm. they all brought that humor to the movie. Mm-hmm. It must feel so special when Amazing. you're in the room and you get you know, or you're hearing it and that magic that just comes off a little impro that leads to something else, but they're all in character and it just falls and you go, right, we're going to have to redo the whole like a ma- dialogue bit or the whole, the whole animation side of it. Does that happen regularly, especially with this amazing cast? Like you say, were you going, well, that it did, impro I mean, work. Yeah. Now we've got to change that whole scene. Did that happen? T- yeah. Typically, typically you try to avoid it. You know, if you go to, if they taught production at school, they would say, don't ever do that. But mm-hmm. uh, the reality is, is like you have to. And like, I think, you know, in some cases, if you, fe- if people, if people on the journey felt like, oh, we're just changing things for change's sake, mm. then that's when you lose the morale of the team. That's when everybody's getting to, going like, oh, these guys don't know what they're doing. Like that's when that whole mentality begins. But the truth is, is like when we were calling people up and being like, hey, you, you know, we've changed the scene, watch it. It's better. <laughs> we got to make it. And everybody was kind of watching and go, it is better. So we got to make that happen. And like, we weren't ever changing anything unless it was a better thing than what it was replacing. And that was always actually more inspiring than demotivating because it was like, oh no, we're pushing something. Like I thought this scene was good, but now it can be great. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, an example of, of, uh, all of this kind of coming together was like the first we had recorded the boys a couple times, but then we needed to record cube for the first time. So we're like, okay, Mm. well Mm. we should record cube with the boys. And, and uh, we set them up. We did a couple of scenes with them and they had never met him before. And then he walked into the room Mm. and they did the under the bridge sequence, you know, and, and like, it just like uh, so much good material is coming out of this, this moment and you know it's really a little bit more live action than than typical uh, f- animated films are recorded but it's it's a magical thing and you can see it on the screen it feels so real and grounded because of that Got yeah you. i mean i think i think the action especially it, or i almost thought i was watching like a nolan intro from like the, the start the way it was the, the, the soundtrack yeah. it was so concise the action uh, I, I think it's like a, definitely one of the big pluses um of, of the movie on top of the comedy is just how slick and professional it feels it does feel like a sort of a big marvel or a dc movie yeah, I mean, there's su- uh, the the level of talent involved in the opening sequence from, you know, our co-director, Kyler Spears, who boarded it, to the Trent and Atticus score that supports it, to oh, yeah. Jeff guiding it, you know. And it's mm. like, it's Sicario. <laughs> like, that's what it's it Sicario. is. <laughs> that, that was the reference. That was the reference. Wow. And, okay. And, that's amazing. And, 
And you know, we, you know, our head of cinematography, Ken Zeki, did、mm. uh, did a whole like presentation of all the different ideas and worked with Jeff on like what was inspiring Jeff, and it was like Boogie Nights and Sicario and、uh, you know Spike Jones and like、mm. that's what that's the movie. <laughs> like it, it's not like you know your traditional references.、Um, mm. You know, we have so many long shots in the film as well that make the film really. You know, we've got several shots that are over a thousand frames, which in、wow. animation is like a very scary、mm. uh, prospect. Um, yeah, <laughs> but it's it's what makes the film feel real because that's kind of how you shoot live action. It really does, make- yeah. It really does have that element of live action, and it, it grounds it and it makes it really compelling. So,、um, yeah, very well done that side. Yeah, yeah, re- really well done. Finally,、um, what have you learned? From making this movie,、uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles: Mutant Mayhem, or a previous movie that you are going to take forward、uh, to your next film, something that you learn as a producer, exec producer. Honestly, like、uh, I've, le- I mean, there's so many things. I'm trying to think of like what 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 would be the one that I would put forward. But you know, I think you know a lot of the movies I worked on before. I was on the Bender side, and I was、uh, kind of a separated from the creative process a little bit, and. And kind of just responding to it as a vendor, as people who get shipped the movie, and then say you guys make it. But this, I got to be a part of something that was so creative, and and you know Jeff and Seth and Evan and Point Grey's amplitude for for success and being great, and、uh, it was so high. The bar they set themselves was so high, and higher than. Most people were setting for them. You know, they they were the ones who were always pushing the boundary, and it was so inspiring to get to be a part of that with them, and to try and get the team to respond positively to the way they work. And, and, and like I said, it was easy most of the time because their ideas were always so strong and so compelling, and and it was it kind of I guess like. Being more reactive and、uh, to the creative process, and instead of trying to like build a production structure that controls the creative process because you have a deadline and you have all these things, like building a creative structure that understands the creative,、uh, the, a production structure that understands the creative process and can support it in different ways. It's not, so, you know, it's something I would love to. Try and get better at as I go in my career, but that's sort of like the fundamental thing is like understanding how different creative groups work together, and then trying to figure out how to make that something that is manageable and possible, and delivers and gives gives the audiences everything that they want. Amazing. Absolutely brilliant! Yeah,、uh, really great advice. Really great, Ramsey McBean. Thank you so much. You've created a wonderful、yeah. film, and we loved, loved it. it. Yeah, we really did. <laughs> we, we had, had a very small part、yeah. of great. You know, yeah, the、part. film is the film is six six hundred people plus in、mm. four different time zones and four different vendors. You know, we have two D animation sequences in there、mm. that were done in Paris. We have. You know, we had two different vendors. We had Micros Animation, who were the sort of lead vendors, and we had Cinesite, who were who did twenty minutes of the movie.、Wow. And you know, that was that was in itself is a whole story, like how having two different studios achieving the same look. And I would wonder, I would ask you guys. Could you tell no. which which、no. vendor did what no, shot? No, and I think that's no, testament no that you、chance. obviously have have learned a lot about <laughs> collaboration, <laughs> collaboration and communication. So,、um, well done for all you've done in the movie.、Yeah. No, I, I I I've been wanting to ask somebody that question for about a year. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, if we can, yeah, if、I、people can come in and watch、no. the movie and they can't、yeah. be like. Yeah, that、no. one felt a bit different than、uh, the. No, than no chance. Not a chance.、Right. Also, just、no. you, I think you're just completely swept up in the story as well, and I think that's that's you know you're not looking for which animation、mm. is different. You're just you're in the characters, you're in the action, you're in the the comedy. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So well done. No, no, and amazing. Amazing. Thank you for your time, Ramsey. Really appreciate it a lot. No, thank you guys so much. It's great. I'm glad you enjoyed the movie, and thank you so much for your support for it. It's、uh, it's a dream come true for a lot of us to to have people love this film. So I, it's I, overwhelming for for people like me to get to share the film with you guys. I love that. Brilliant. Of course. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much. Awesome. Cheers. Cool. Bye. See you later. 
So there we have it. Uh, that's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Mutant Mayhem is out in cinemas now. Uh, this isn't just for kids. This is fantastic. Really fun movie. If you like turtles it's as a definitely kid. Definitely for the adults. Yes, there's definitely a lot of adult jokes in there, but um, that doesn't mean you should be put off because there were a lot of kids in there when we were watching it, wasn't there? And I think mm. a lot of them went over their heads, uh, those jokes. And you can imagine, it's Seth Rogen, boys and girls. Of course it's going to um, yeah. have a little bit of naughtiness in there but it's wonderful it's yep. so good so huge shout out to Jeff Rowe and to Ramsey McBean for giving us so much knowledge and advice of making that movie and from them uh, so there you go I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Filmmakers Podcast go out there make your films make your animation come up with a story become a turtle become a turtle uh, learn martial arts and turn green yeah and you can be Michelle. There we go. Michelle. Mi- <laughs> you can be Michelle. No. Uh- <laughs> yeah, don't be, don't be shellfish. <laughs> oh, my gosh. See, oh, we, we did so well we throughout so the episode. Well. <laughs> <laughs> the end. Um, yes, yeah. so go out there, make your films. And if you're lucky enough to rise up and do well, it is your duty to... Jump down into the sewers and fight bad guys as a turtle. Cowbunga, dudes. Till next Tuesday. We're lean, we're green, and we're mean. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> that is a reference to the film, by the way. It's not just Dom. Um, yeah. 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 Good. Ah, I mean, it might be. It might be. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows what's happening? Who knows? On next week's episode, it will be Jane Gull and Karen Newman talking all about their film Love Without Walls, which is out now on digital platforms. Beautiful, beautiful film. Go support it. Why not? Why not support all the indie films uh, and the filmmakers you hear from on this show? But that's next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Adios.